So JavaScript is part one. Um, JavaScript is an idea where we try and get uh, as much of uh, like artsy front end tech stack uh, understood by as many people as possible. Um, we've we've made these decisions over the course of many years and tried to come to the conclusion of why each individual part of the artsy front end makes sense. Um, but a lot of this is quite different from the other tech stacks that have existed inside artsy. And so we want to take some time to try and understand every single major component of the artsy front end stack. So we're going to go from um, React, which is where we'll start. Then we'll be moving through to TypeScript to um, then we're going to talk about state in React. And there's two different alternatives to how we deal with that, both local state and external state. You'll understand as we get there. Um, and then there's one more thing that I can't quite remember. Style components. We'll talk about how we style things and how that uh, and why that's different from what it used to be beforehand. Um, all of these should be built in a workshop-like structure, so everyone's already brought their computer along, so it gives everyone a chance to work along, ask questions at any time. Um, these like these things. We have a room full of people that know the fundamentals about all of them, so any of your questions should be answerable. If they're not answerable then we're going to have a really interesting discussion. Um, so I'm going to let uh, Luke and I start off with JavaScript on React. Awesome. Thanks for watching. Cool, cool. So guys, thank, uh, welcome to Intro to React. Um, so it's our first session. And basically, well, when I went back and forth on the format, I was thinking a presentation would make sense at some point, but we we're like, nah, I think the best way to really show React is like working through building an app together from scratch and seeing what that looks like and the tools involved. Um, so yeah, so for the next hour, I'm, I'm real, really quickly gonna go through the key concepts, like whatever we all need to know in order to be on the same page. Um, but obviously you could literally spend an, an entire hour just talking about the concepts and what makes React React. So we are, we're going to do that. And as we go through a coding session, if there's concepts that I think are relevant to talk about, I'll just bring it up. Um, then I'll quickly go through a version of whatever we're about to build in mobile that I did on my own, but I don't think we'll have time to do both. So well, I'll just explain what's going on and you can ask questions as well. Uh, and yeah, basically throughout the whole thing, like if there's anything you're not clear of or you want me to elaborate, just you know, stop me and we can go through it, so. Cool, so why does React, right? So the official definition you'll find on the website, uh, on, the, on the React website is a JavaScript library for building user interfaces, right? Um, so what does that mean? So, well, a few things. So it's an open source project. It was started at Facebook, right? Like they were trying to solve a very particular problem that we have as web developers. Um, so now it's being maintained by a huge community. It's about five years old now, so it's matured a lot in, in the past few years. Um, and you can use it to build a few things. So like um, web is like the most popular, but you can also use it to build mobile apps, VR, and a bunch of other different you know platforms you can actually use React on. So Ubuntu. Oh, Ubuntu, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and Windows. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, so basically I'm just gonna go through the React architecture, some of the design choices, uh, a bit more in depth, so. <clears throat> so yeah, I'm just gonna get a brief background on what problems React was designed to solve, right? Um, so, so the first one is the DOM, so I think we all kind of, have some idea of what the DOM is, we've heard, the, we've heard it before. So it stands for the document object model, right? So anytime you go in a browser and you um, go to a URL, first thing the browser does is download this string of text, which is HTML, right? Um, so the, the goal, the, the, um, what the browser has to do next is parse that and it turns it into this object model uh, of the HTML. So you can actually interact with the page in JavaScript, right? Um, and the way you do that, well, that, that's basically the goal of the DOM, but the, what that allows you to do also is build dynamic pages and apps, right? So once the page is rendered, you can actually add new elements to the page and so on. Some of the problems with the DOM is it's just probably the slowest API in JavaScript in general. So any changes, mutations you do to it is going to take significantly longer than 
any operations you would do in JavaScript like V8. So because of that, um, a lot of the MVC frameworks that we do, they need to optimize around updating to the DOM, like batching operations and things of that sort. <clears throat> so React came, came around with this concept of virtual DOM. And so the virtual DOM, you can think of it as a lightweight version of the DOM that's, that lives in the JavaScript uh, side. So it's not actually implemented um, in the browser and it allows you to do operations much faster. However, it won't actually show on the screen, right? So when you make updates to the virtual DOM, it actually um, stays in the React in memory runtime. Um, and it's only after a while React is op optimized to then write those changes to the real DOM. <clears throat> uh, I just pulled some random diagram I found, but yeah, this gives you an idea of what goes on, right? So if you make a few changes to uh, some component in your, in your tree in React, um, it'll actually figure out uh, what the, the state of the app was at some point and the state after you made your changes. And it'll run a different algorithm to figure out what changes to apply to real DOM. So that, 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 uh, that allows for um, React to run significantly faster in terms of making DOM updates than if you would if you were just doing them to the DOM directly. <clears throat> Makes sense so far. Yeah, my favorite feature of this is that you only write perfect code. You don't have to write transitional code between two different states. So it's like if you wanted to show, like, uh, you know, show or hide a, a particular element on the screen, you actually just don't put it on the screen the next time that you need to make a change. And React will handle removing and adding it for you, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, in iOS, for example, there's a lot of code that's about if this exists, then remove this. Oh, Switch it around, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If it's in the state of removing right now, then it's just yeah. wait for it to animate. React handles all of those, mm -hmm. and because of this idea of virtual DOM. Yeah. yeah. Actually, so, um, is it possible that that diff that is doing in the virtual DOM uh, is the virtual DOM ends up being more expensive than the actual component shopping thing? Could be, but it doesn't matter because it's an abstraction away from you at this point. So in the worst case scenario, it'll be equal, right? Yeah. There's so much of things that you can do to like optimize it to try and prevent that from happening. If, but I think the idea is like kind of like profile your application, find out there's like a hotspot, and then optimize those points. Yeah. Sure optimizing yeah. Cool. Um, but yeah, actually. So well, as you know, we use Backbone a lot in you know our apps. Um, so like one thing we want to think of is how does React compare to other MVC frameworks? I think Backbone because we're all familiar with it. Um, if you're not, I'll just run through. So Backbone is like one of like the most popular MVC frameworks you'll, you that were around, um, um, like around the angle and Angular. Well, Angular is still popular, but um, so a lot, of, a lot of times we compare those two, but they're actually not one to one, right? So like you'll hear, you'll hear a lot that React is like the V in MVC. Um, so like React really only handles the view part of of what an MVC framework like Backbone would do. So Backbone also like allows you to you know fetch data like basically the model the data layer uh, and the controller which is you know getting the data basically presenting the data and all your business logic right so but actually you could use Backbone with 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 React technically as doable um, but yeah <laughs> in theory we do right that's some of your work yeah actually <laughs> so, yeah so. <laughs> Some of the problems with Babylon, right, or most MVC frameworks, as y'all know, is pretty easy to, as your app grows, as there's like more states and more views to, to handle, it, it becomes much harder to reason about what's actually going on in your app, right? You have like one event that triggers some, some model to change, would also trigger some other model to change and so on. So it's, it's a tough mental model to really um, scale in terms of like larger applications. Um, and Everything I mentioned around the virtual DOM and actually change, making mutations to the DOM is applicable to backbone. Like it's way slower to do that. So if you're not careful, you can easily like make your app much slower tenfold. Um, yeah, versus React, right? So 
Uh, React really changed how we think about developing the mental model around developing applications, right? So in, in React, there's this concept of data, uh, one-way data flow, meaning that the data usually only goes one, well, there are cases where, when that's not true, but for the most part, when you develop your application, you have a top level com, 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 excuse me, com, component uh, and the data just goes through like, you know, your tree of, uh, of components, but it usually only goes one way. It makes it a lot easier to reason about the state and well, basically the data flowing through your app. Cool, with that being said, um, just gonna go through. So yeah, we figured it'd make more sense to actually look at the documentation for React. So I'm gonna take you guys to um, the website and there's some live examples on there that we can run through. <laughs> yeah, sure. Awesome. Cool. <clears throat> so, is that big enough? Yeah. Okay. You can also hear it. Cool. So, um, here's like the most, one of the most simple basic components you can build in React. If you've never seen um, JavaScript or the ES6, which is like the latest version of JavaScript, um, they recently -ish introduced the concept of classes, which you're all familiar with in other languages like Java and so on. Um, so that's basically what's going on here. So you, um, so I, I should talk about components first. So like everything in React is a component in, in the sense that um, there are stateless components, which are, you know, they handle everything from uh, rendering um, the markup to the styling and the logic around that component. So it's a single unit that allows you to write reusable code. Um, and, and you can abstract all everything that's to do with the implementation of that component. So you can use it without knowing ex exactly how it's, uh, how it's built, right? Uh, and the only, the only method that you need to implement for to have a, a valid component is the render method. So that render method needs to return like a, some, one, well actually one top level React component. Um, and um, <clears throat> so actually in this case, right, you have some XML in there, which if you haven't seen JSX before, so I actually that language is called JSX and it's an extension on uh, ES6 that allows you to use XML to express um, React components. So you could use it, you could actually write React without using it, but it makes it a lot more readable. Um, and actually, I remember the first time I saw that, I was like, yo, it basically goes against <laughs> everything we've ever, <laughs> like for every, you know, separation of concerns, like make sure you have your markup in one place and your style in one place. Like React literally took that and I was like, yo, <laughs> we just throw literally everything, in, the logic along with the actual rendering actually goes in the same file, which can be you know weird at first, but um, it actually makes it well. You have the power of JavaScript to render your your component versus using some template template language or you know whatever we use in Backbone. Don't worry, worry. The, the lack of separation of concerns is going to be a focal <laughs> point in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, so in this demo, if you guys go in there, actually, you can play with it, but. You can um, see, like, as I'm typing, the result is, is rendering here. Um, so just to break down that uh, line right here. So the, <clears throat> the React DOM that render, you don't see the imports statements actually in this example, but the, if you were to actually build this in a real app, um, you would have to import React and React DOM. So React DOM in this case is what we call a renderer for React. So the implementation of uh, the, the virtual DOM and algorithm we're talking about was split at some point um, when they introduced React Native. So you could actually use that React code in multiple, like in different renderings, and that's how you actually render it to the DOM. Um, For example, I have an SVG renderer that I built. It takes something like that and turns it into an SVG. No. Yeah, um, and then, <clears throat> so here you can see that line um, using that XML, you know, syntax that was introduced. Um, and so it's basically passing in a prop. So 
props is how you get data from a parent into a child for the child to do something with it essentially, right? Um, and in this case, it's just passing a, a name property and you can see it's been accessed here. So it's like the most basic example you can think of, but it gives you an idea of how you compose, you know, very um, components to build something bigger, basically. Um, the, the next example, I'm not gonna go in depth in it, but basically it introduces the, the concept of state in a component. Um, there's gonna be a whole session on that, so I'm not really gonna go in depth, but yeah, props and state are different, and you know, it can be confusing when to use one over the other, but. Um, are props immutable? Yeah, so it's recommended, like props, the idea of props is once it's passed into the component, it should stay the same throughout the life cycle of the component. So it'll warn you to if you try to mutate it. I think TypeScript will allow it. Mm -hmm. Straight up, you compile it. Like yeah, it won't let you. <clears throat> cool. So, all right, I think that's decent of an intro. I think we can go into um, building something small. Um, so, if you guys installed. Um, Create React app. Yeah, Node and Create, create React app, uh, which is like this command line tool to bootstrap a React app and it'll install the server and stuff. Um, but we can do it real quick. One, one quick thing about creating React app is that mm -hmm. it's just like a good JavaScript development environment. Like even if you're not even writing React, like it has like modern JS and it like reloads everything for mm -hmm. you and has a team. It's like a great starting point. Yeah, absolutely. So my <coughs> friends are building like their entire business off a single create React app. Like you can just, it can take you from like a tiny demo like this to a full like hard city boss level app. Yeah, and I actually we'll talk a bit more about the server and some of the configs in there. But so yeah, I already have it installed, so it shouldn't take much time. But if you run it, um, you should have that there. Um, and then what you want to do is run create React app, uh, and then just some name for I'll just call it React uh, RT demo. Just name it whatever you want. <laughs> now everyone's going to be hammering the internet at the exact same time. <laughs> So what's, what it's doing there is it's installing all the dependencies you need to um, have a, a, a page running essentially with the server and all the dev dependencies needed as well. <clears throat> a question about dependencies. It's a naive question, but what's the difference between Yarn and NPM when it comes to dependencies? Not a naive question. Um, yeah. the, it's nuanced, but they both have different algorithms for deciding a hierarchy of dependencies. So uh, Node is pretty unique in that you can have uh, multiple copies of the same dependency in the same dependency tree, right? So I could have, let's, let's say Reaction, right? We could have a, three different versions of Reaction in the same app if we wanted to. I mean, we don't, but each of them have different ways of trying to like shrink down that tree to be as small as possible. Um, and that's the biggest change nowadays. Uh, plus, we just like Yarn because it has a, a nicer command line and does caching better. A small mm -hmm. so if you want to add a new dependency, you would suggest you use Yarn now? Yeah. yeah. All our documentation everywhere will generally say Yarn in the JavaScript projects. When, when Yarn first started, like it's like big selling point was that it had a lock file. Lock file. Whereas before, it's like you could go and deploy your app to production using NPM. And like as it's fetching, your dependencies, there's like a minor change or app would break because there was no explicit lock file. And so Yarn introduced that and then NPM went and created that. And that, that as well. And you, when it first came out, it was like 10 times faster in certain cases yeah. than NPM. Uh, I don't know if that's still true, but it uh, should it be at this point. Yeah. But you still need both of them. Just you need to you install need, you need Yarn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Node yeah. comes with NPM and Yarn is a separate install. Yeah. That's also the confusing bit that NPM is both client to the, the, the package management cloud that is NPM. And Yarn makes use of the same cloud, but it's just different clients. Yeah. So the NPM tool on your internal, that is the client we're replacing also with Yarn. 
Oh, so still makes you use the same yeah. 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 They want to be like abstract. They actually asked if CocoaPods could be like something that Yarn could handle as well, for example. Um, so they just see themselves as a dependency manager of things. Just happens to be focused on JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so yeah, actually, so what we were building, I figured we'd do something kind of relevant to what we do here. So um, I just, just went through metaphysics and pulled uh, the most popular artists uh, like from the query. Um, this, so that's what's in that JSON file that's in, on the GitHub repo. And basically, we're just going to go through the exercise of building components to render that data um, and just get an idea of what goes into, like the design choices that goes into it. So. Uh, once you run that command, um, you can see the in there. Um, use whatever editor you want. I think most of us use Visual Studio Code, but uh, sub T, yeah. I got noticed I also need to do the mpm install dash g of flow dash bin. That's optional. Okay. If it's, it kind of popped up. If it forced you to do it, do it. But right mm -hmm. now. Okay. That's like an alternative type system. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, so that the, uh, the the create React app script um, gives you this file structure as uh, like when you initialize a project. So, right away you already have um, an H. Well, you have index.js with the rendering of that uh, of the top level of the root level component, as we were looking at before. Uh, it also imports uh, CSS, um, which is enabled by some Webpack plugin, but essentially you get that for free. You don't have to do anything there. Um, so if we go ahead and run it, um, it's just running the outside in the same folder. So you can do it for VS Code at in the previous terminal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> should mention that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's the page that you get. Um, and right away you see it says to get started, edit the uh, source app.js file and save to reload. Um, so it already has uh, what we call hot module reloading uh, enable. Uh, and what that allows you to do is make changes to your implementation and your JS files and at, um, at a runtime while it's running, it'll actually swap the implementation of the code for you while keeping the state. So you oh, can. Yeah. I don't think it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Oh, it doesn't? Mm -hmm. It'll do a full, but it's really easy to add. Yeah. <laughs> It's like three lines of code. Okay, so it, it doesn't keep the state part, you say? Yeah, it should like reload the whole thing like it's in. Oh, snap. Okay, sure. Oh, what do you call this? You call this live reloading instead, right? Yeah, it's live reloading. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. Small nuance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess it doesn't do that. So my head. <laughs> if you want it to do it, it's just if module.hot, module.hot. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, if you work on four, so other projects, we have that in there. Um, but yeah, live reloading is also, I guess, pretty good um, to get started. It's an acceptable with. trade off. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so as you can tell, as we make changes here, it shows up on that side of the page. Um, and so, like, a quick thing I, I, I want to mention is the code in that component looks basically, it's, it looks like HTML, but it really isn't, right? Keep in mind, these are actually components there, and they, it, that code actually gets compiled back down to regular JavaScript. Um, cool. So, so in the React code, if you like open their source code, there isn't there as good as a component. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you import React, it actually imports like all the HTML like tags for you. Um, so that's why it looks like you're just writing. HTML, but it's really not. <clears throat> so I'm gonna create a component um, to render. Well, actually, I guess maybe I should start with importing the data and putting the data in there. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, if you go to the repo, scriptures. Um, I think I, yeah, I have a link somewhere. So yeah, if you click on that link, the download. JSON link, we'll get some JSON object. So just, um, eh, actually, let's just copy it. It's probably easier. <laughs> yeah. So just copy it. Um, 
So yeah, you just want to throw it in the source file, just create like artists.json and just paste that stuff in there. So we have some data to work with. Um, and then um, you can go ahead and just import that. So you just do artists data from artists. Actually, uh, I found out from Orta, you don't have to put the file extension for JSON and it gets imported. So I know that. Yeah. So yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. So now we have some data to work with. Um, and <clears throat> I guess just to make sure it's what we expect. Um, I'll just console that out. <clears throat> um, I, th I think you guys are all familiar with the dev console in Chrome. Or I don't know which browser you're using, but uh, open some JavaScript console. <laughs> and anyway, so the data is there. We can, we can use it. Um, so, so I'll start off by creating a new component to render each individual item, <laughs> each uh, artist in that list. So uh, you want to extend the component class in React, and then we're going to define a render function. So, so one common error people run into a lot when they first get started with React is um, sometimes you don't really like. I guess you'll get that. I can show you the error actually, but <laughs> <laughs> but if you add two, you can only have one uh, top root. Uh, top level component being returned. They added uh, support for f what we call fragments, I believe, I, in React 16. Yeah, but yeah. it's it's recent that it's been introduced. And but for the most part, you'll see only like a top level component, whether it's a div or something else. Um, Eventually, yeah. it has to become one. That makes sense. Yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, so um, let me see if I remember the class names that <laughs> I use in the CSS. Um, okay, but anyway, so yeah, that'll be our container for all the data. So, so the reason why you had to do class name, not class name, is because the React was on the button, they couldn't use class. Yeah. So they had to use class name. So right. Yeah. So, and class is a reserved keyword in JavaScript. JavaScript. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. It is hard to start them yet. Mm -hmm. um, cool. So, let's just, I guess, um, you know, print out the names for one thing. So, so to do that, um, we're going to access the props object that we'll be passing in later when we render those elements. But um, just assume there's a name prop that will be passed in. Um, so this really tripped me up when I was first learning JSX. Mm -hmm. In order to get JavaScript evaluated in JSX, you have to surround it by curly braces. Yeah, yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's how you. Uh, put in the, uh, some JavaScript code inside of your JSX. So. <clears throat> so yeah, so and then we can go ahead and uh, actually render our newly made component. So what I'm going to do here is uh, use uh, the map um, method that's on the array class in JavaScript. And what that allows, yeah, basically I'm just mapping the, the JSON objects to uh, React components. Uh, and then we'll just add that into the render function um, for the app, essentially. So, uh, no, sure. See, I need to pass in, yeah. I am. <clears throat> and then we'll, um, they will define that name property that we're using in the component. So thing is just item that name. One thing in, in ES6, you have this sort of automatic return. Um, if you use an arrow function and just kind of wrap it in friends, mm -hmm. that's a new feature. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and remove all this. Oh. Brackets again, and then just render artists. Yeah. Okay, let's see when that looks thick. Okay, hey. yeah, boom. So, <laughs> yeah, so we have our list of names. 
Um, doesn't look very nice, but <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, a start. We'll, we'll fix that later. It's a start. <laughs> um, cool. So um, if we go to that object, there's a bunch of other properties in there. So there's um, there's a href which would link to the RT page, um, and then the image. So we can use that to to decorate that those items a bit. All right, I need to look at that. You wrap it in a matter. It didn't matter. Yeah, 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 I totally forgot. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. Mm, there's that, and then there's the image. Then, <clears throat> um, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. So for styling purposes, I use the background image uh, CSS property for that image um, div. So once we bring in the CSS, it'll actually you know add all the styling to it. But but yeah, I guess I should mention that all the all uh, HTML tag like React components have style as a property. So you could just pass in you know any CSS you would de define in the regular CSS file there. Um, if you're if you're creating your own component, um, it's like one thing that often happens is like you try to add in a style tag. You're like, oh, it's not actually styling anything. It's because you have to pass the style tag down to, yeah. down mm -hmm. to your div. Yeah. Um, actually, apply it. Cool. For me, I think it's. Uh, Go to page three in the yeah. Oh, uh, that's where the yeah. So the name goes in there. So you could. So the way the reason is structured that way is for the CSS to just kind of work. Um, but if you move your name h three tag inside of a meta meta class, um, uh, it'll apply some styling to it, and also we'll put the bio in there. Are those uh, backticks for the URL? Yeah. So this is what we call a string template um, in ES6. So it allows you to interpolate some strings inside of a of a string. So the the syntax is backtick URL, and then dollar sign, um, and then curly brackets, and you put the stuff in there. So by default, React uh, strings in JavaScript when they're like double quoted or single quoted, just don't do any interpolation. You would normally have to like you know finish it do a plus and then put something else at the end. So they introduced a third, a third, like, signal, but <coughs> second type of string. Yeah. Cool. Uh, let me see. I think I'm forgetting something. Yeah. Um, all right. Actually, that should do it. So let's see what that looks like. It's not gonna look very pretty, but uh, thank God, Chris, Katarina's not here, so it's <laughs> <laughs> so good. Ah. Uh, this dot props dot image dot URL. What's the JSON look like? I think you have to pass the item property, right? Oh, yeah. You might not put it down in yeah. the the props at the bottom for now. Oh yeah, that's right. Yes, thanks. So we need to actually pass those in. Um, there's technically a way to make this work without declaring each property, but just to make it explicit, I'm just going to do this here. But you could do what we call an object spread. Which we actually do a lot, and it just would copy all the properties of a JavaScript object as <coughs> to the component. Actually, I mean, I, I can do it just so you <laughs> probably makes more sense. I can do it here. Um, I think from, from like a React perspective, though, it is kind of better to be more explicit. Yeah. So like, you can always be sure of what the bounds of the API of your component is. And, mm -hmm. You know, as like a someone coming onto a code base. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Magic that you can choose to use. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, just to be more explicit and know, like, so you'll see in TypeScript we actually have um, the concept of interfaces for components. But since we're using regular JavaScript, unless you have the props to find, you'd have to go to the implementation to find out, you know, what properties are exposed. Um, uh, I, I actually will. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or you can use uh, prop types. Prop types. Yeah. yeah. That's one time checking as well. Yeah. Yeah, I had one so far. If you want, follow. Yeah. 
Share yeah, that image. All right, yeah. So, yeah, the image doesn't show because there's no there's no CSS for for this, but it's there. Um, so I think it's a good time to copy over the CSS in there. <clears throat> um, so, so wait, I think Barry said the link doesn't work, but then I said it didn't go to raw. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. All right. So yeah, it does work. <laughs> so yeah, if you copy over this uh, CSS file and paste it in there, it should apply some styling to this. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Boom. There you go. So, <laughs> cool. So yeah, super basic. It doesn't do much. Uh, I was thinking about adding like you know input and filtering and stuff like that, but this is actually a, like I would say at least over 50% of what we do at RCS is displaying, displaying some style JSON, I guess. So this is actually pretty relevant to what you what we do here. Um, so yeah, um, a few things that we do if this was actually production code, and like you have, uh, um, a lot of times, you know, you have, um, well, I guess a good pattern to have is to only have one component per module, if you will. So a good um, a good practice there would be to move that new component we created uh, into its own file and import it. In. So um, a module just, is a file, basically. Yeah. So you just copy that over. Um, we need to add some imports. So just React and component here. And um, and then to make it available, you need to export that component, right? So. Um, there's you could you could do it default because <laughs> you want to say why it's not good. I forget. <laughs> I forget. <laughs> okay. So if you do export default, that means that anyone from any other file can import it and name it whatever they want. Um, but if you just export it like that, then when the module bundler is searching for the file, it knows to look explicitly for artist item. Mm -hmm. So it makes it statically analyzable. And, yeah. and it, it prevents things like drift from occurring. Cool. So, so you want to do that? You saw auto right there. Yeah. That's not possible with, with uh, export, yeah, the full exports. Uh, but anyway, it still works. We just moved the component somewhere else. So at this point, what's really cool is you're just using this component without needing to know what how it's implemented, right? All you need to do is pass in your props, and as long as you know there's a, the the API is not misleading, you can just kind of go by what is defined to to use it, right? And we do a lot of that with Reaction and you know other frameworks that or libraries we use as well. Um, Anyway, so that's that. I'm going to show you, I guess, a mobile version of this. It's not styled, but it's basically the same, uh, the same app. Um, really quick. Yeah. What's up with the key? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. That's a good point. So uh, if you have a list of items uh, in React, um, for, the, for the diff algorithm to keep track of each component, you need to give them uh, you know, unique keys, essentially. Since we have a list of artist items, um, you, we just need to de define a key here. Um, so I'll just use the ID, which is like globally. Um, Do you have it in the JSON? I think so. It's not, you can use name, right? Oh, yeah. In this right. case, name is Yeah, in this case, name is fine. Yeah, OK. I don't have an ID it's in, in the JSON. Cool. Oh, yeah, no, it is. It is. So yeah, so, um, <clears throat> so now you won't get that error anymore, because each, each component has an ID, uh, as, a, as a key. Um, Cool. That's a good example from Ashcan's question earlier about like the efficiency. If if you have an item in an array and all of them don't have a key, then realistically you have to reload that entire array every single time because you can't know what has changed inside mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So is the um, I mean like coming at this from a more object oriented perspective, I'm used to like having an artist item and passing in a model. It seems here it's more like I'm passing in the like primitive values that it needs. That's sort of the style. Yeah, I think well, we do we do pass in models. Um, if you look at the code and you know reaction, not reaction. Um, both. Yeah, both actually, both reaction and the mission. You'll see a lot of times we pass an artist as a J JavaScript object. But at this point, it's also because we're using TypeScript to define all our types and so on. But 
Um, actually, I don't know. It's what's a good. I honestly, don't have a strong opinion on yeah. both. Like the problem, we have different opinions, which is reasonable. Like yeah. relay, for example, simplifies that so much that you probably wouldn't write it where you just did this. Mm -hmm. You would pass the entire object because yeah. we know because we can guarantee with compilation. Um, but for like leaf objects like this, then I would probably try and put it the exact bits of data that you would put in. So, so it's a matter of like some nuanced opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions? Nope. Awesome. Cool. All right. So, so now I'm just gonna load the pre-built app I did. Um, if you want, so in order to run this part of the of the workshop, you would need to have Xcode installed. Which is kind of why I rather not get into this. this. <laughs> <laughs> Spend the but, entire hour to just on that. <laughs> so yeah, I'll just show you guys what it, uh, it looks like. So um, si um, similarly to create React app, there's also an, another uh, tool called create React native app, which does a similar thing. Um, and it comes with, uh, so there's a company called Expo. They build tools around um, for developing React Native apps. Um, so yeah, anyway, that's what we're going to be using here. And I'll just show you what it looks like. Um, uh, Cab's uh, startup uh, arena, for example, built their entire React Native app in this. Yeah. So it's actually pretty cool. Once, so once you run, I, I already had to run uh, Create React Native app. So when you, when you run Yarn Start there, um, it's going to start the React Native Packager, which is the equivalent of you know the server we were just playing with uh, in the in the web version, uh, and one thing you'll see is like this huge QR code <laughs> in the thing. But that is actually so Expo um, have they have an app you can download in the App Store, both for Android and iOS, and it's like a sandbox with all like native code um, you need to run um, your re your JavaScript code already pre built in there. So. You could just literally send a URL to someone, and they can play with you know some React Native project you've been working on. Uh, so that's kind of what we're going to do here. Um, you so for iOS, it actually lets you put in your number, and it takes you like a link. So I'll show you guys what it looks like on my phone. <laughs> um, yeah. No. Oh. Ah, I no. think you can't do it because he's uh, recording. You think so? No, no, it might be. Let me try again. I think it might be uh, iTunes. <laughs> yeah, boom. Oh, there you go. So good. Okay, cool. So, all right. So, anyway, so if I do this, you'll see I get some text technically. Yeah, there you go. So, that's the expo link. Um, you can just open that. So, what it actually does once you load it on your phone is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, built, it actually built the JavaScript on like just for that request. So you're literally like doing a, a request except it's on like on the on a native app. So all these that's like the the same code, um, the same thing JSON we're looking at, but with native views. Um, and anyway, so it's super fast. I mean, you, it's, there might be some lag here, but on my phone it's super fast. Um, and it's pretty simple, but you get the idea. Like you're actually running native code there. Um, so we can look at the implementation uh, a bit as a comparison. <clears throat> so uh, not sure. Oh, my bad. Yeah. yeah. Pressure, dude. Uh, okay. Cool. Yeah, and if you want to look at the code, you can just pull the repo. But um, so yeah, so that's um, so for one thing, on on native, there's no concept of CSS, right? Technically, so uh, there are there's React Native comes with like a CSS to like native style uh, uh, compiler, I guess, or I forget exactly what it does, but I would call it a reconciler. All right, yeah. <laughs> so you can use like CSS, and but really it maps down to like native style um, that it gets applied. 
Um, but, only the Flexbox products. Right, only the Flexbox API, um, which I don't know if uh, you guys have like written an iOS app in native code before, but it has this thing, this API called auto layout to, to usually do layouts in your code, which is a lot more verbose and difficult to learn. So the fact that you can use Flex, Flexbox to make native apps is actually pretty awesome. Yeah, it's a unique feature. I'd argue that all layout is more powerful, but considerably more complex. Yeah. Like maybe two orders of magnitude. By far. <laughs> so but anyway, so that's the code for that super simple view, but it gives you an idea of how it compares to the JS side, the JS uh, implementation. I guess we can literally have them side by side and, and look at what's going on. So, as you can tell, I have another. I also have an artist item component. So, and the API is essentially the same, right? You're passing the same props. The only difference is I'm not using a div uh, in there. It's actually using some React Native um, components to to build a build like the building blocks, so the image, the view, and so on. Um, so there are, there's a list of them, obviously. You can go on in the docs and see what's going on. But the great thing is, you know, as a web developer, you can like go into a, a, a mobile app code base and know basically what's going on without having to, you know, deal with native code like Objective-C, which is pretty powerful. Um, and also, one great thing about React Native um, is you can actually also do, well, the real hot reloading thing. So anytime you make changes, to, to this it actually shows up on your device in almost real time. And like doing that, basically in Xcode, it would take just about like 10 times longer to see, change something, and then you'd have to recompile it and see that change. So yeah, it would be about 30 seconds for Eigen to yeah. see a single change. And, and it's funny too, because like if you're working in a mission, it's actually faster than the web. Like our web not reloading, yeah. like kind of significantly faster. Wow. Yeah. It's yeah. like very sub second. Like yeah. maybe two or three hundred milliseconds. Yeah. Going back to the web after working on React Native, you're just like, oh, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so like yeah, so if I change the text for instance, you'll see like it's actually on my phone, it just reloaded. So I just added those things on there. And it already showed up, right? So yeah, I think that's pretty dope. Um, yeah, to those not familiar with native development, this might seem trivial, but this is such a time save. Like the amount of time we save as native developers at RC over a year. Uncalculable. Mm -hmm. I have a question. So this class, the um, I guess the data class, is it possible to also share them between uh, different implementation? Like you say, in our force and uh, eigen the native implementation. This stuff is actually like just getting the data and reading the data, and sharing it. Um. So that's actually one thing we want to work towards. So you'll see in, a, in another, well, I guess in the style component session, we'll hopefully kind of touch on that. But um, there's a there's a native um, version of style components, if you will. So you can actually write some CSS to style your components. And that technically we could reuse um, between uh, the web and native version. So it's something I think we should definitely explore and as we're consolidating our styles. But at this point, it's not really the case. I know some projects actually, um, there's a project called React Native Web and React Native Mobile. So you could literally use the same like um, building blocks, like view, uh, image, and it actually would render both um, in a web and, and mobile. Uh, but we don't use it uh, at RTC, but it's, it's possible. Yeah, the way to think about that abstraction is that like, what if you had the same code except where you had artist item, it was just different on iOS and different on web. So almost all the code is the same except the one end, like the, the leaf, if you will, the last part of that tree. Yeah. Yeah. But for instance, like so flat list is, uh, as you know, in mobile, it's usually like a list of items. Um, so it's like a native implementation of um, like the, like Liz view that you would see in iOS um, and super is optimized for re uh, object pooling. So view pooling essentially. So it'll only render, um, you know, whatever is in the view, in the, like in the viewport um, and anything else would not get rendered until you scroll down. So anyway, some optimizations that you need to do for mobile versus um, web where you don't need to do these things. Um, 
Yeah, because you got Chrome doing that for you under the hood, basically. Mm -hmm. That's why you see a white screen when you scroll fast. Yeah. I mean, the, to tag on to what Oksana was saying, mm -hmm. uh, I think one uh, total code sharing is obviously a nice thing. But React specifically talks about rather it's a play on like from the Java time where there was like write once and deploy everywhere. React specifically uses learn once and write everywhere. So the difference being you know how React works, how the concept of components, uh, props, state, and whatnot. But the APIs might be, but the, the, the building blocks might be named slightly different depending on the platform. But mobile developers that are used to React on the web have contributors to emission, which uses a different build mm -hmm. And you know, and that's like one of the key fundamentals. That's what changed the like Artsy's engineering culture considerably. The ability for us all to be using the same like group tools instead of having very siloed, like separate teams on the front end. Cool. Um, so yeah, if you want to run this, um, like I, I mentioned before, you, you got to install Xcode. Um, because it actually compiles that it, it's actually running. Um, actually, you only need to get to the simulator. Yeah, just for a simulator. So if you if you install it, I haven't tried that, but I think if you download the Expo app without, because um, it actually pushes your code to the phone. So yeah, the, yeah, so actually we should try that. But I think you may be uh, you may be able to get away without installing Expo, which would be nice. Maybe. I think you get forced into it anyway with yeah. Homebrew. So yeah. it's just process. Yeah. All right, cool. Anyway, that's all I had. So, questions? Questions? <laughs>